tonight on Primetime Politics, coming together for Canadian pensions. We will be uh, convening a special meeting of the provincial, territorial and federal finance minister to talk about the Canada Pension Plan. The Deputy Prime Minister agrees it is time for the country's finance ministers to talk about the CPP and Alberta's proposal to withdraw from the plan. Coming up, we will speak with Ontario's finance minister who initiated the call for this pan-Canadian get-together. And... We must acknowledge that we've not been doing enough to safeguard our democracy. Aaron O'Toole returns to Parliament to share his ongoing concerns about foreign interference. Is the government doing enough to respond? We'll speak with our political observers. This is Primetime Politics. Hello everyone, I'm Michael Serapio. A letter went out and now the federal finance minister, Christian Freeland, says a meeting will happen with her provincial and territorial counterparts to discuss Alberta's proposal to withdraw from the Canada Pension Plan and to address concerns of what that might do to the retirement security of Canadians right across the country. It is absolutely my conviction and the federal government's conviction that the CPP works really, really well for all Canadians, for all Albertans, and I am looking forward to the opportunity to discuss that further with the finance ministers of all the provinces and territories in the days to come. Peter Bethlen Falvey is Ontario's Minister of Finance. He is the one who issued the letter yesterday calling for this pan-Canadian meeting on the CPP, and he joins us right now from Queen's Park in Toronto. Minister, really happy you're on the program. Thank you for being here. Good to be with you, Michael. Now, Alberta, as you know, has just begun their public consultations, this ahead of a promised referendum on the CPP. But in your letter, you say this proposal could cause serious harm. What kind of harm are you talking about? Well, you know, we're, I think we're stronger together. So uh, the Canada Pension Plan has shown since it was founded in 1965 to be a reliable, sustainable, stable, something that Canadians uh, never had to worry about. And, uh, and, and I think that's one of the testaments to Canadian federalism. And so, you know, I think any time that someone is uh, frustrated with how things are going, it's good to have a conversation. And, and I do worry about uh, Ontarians. You know, we, we've certainly been a uh, big uh, supporter of all things pan-Canadian, and the Canada Pension Plan is something that we feel quite strongly about. I would add that, uh, you know, the, the methodology that they're using, uh, which uh, others have uh, looked at and said, well, if, if we use that methodology, Ontario would get 65% of the assets. So just two provinces at almost 120% of the assets. So uh, I think some of the other provinces, BC, maybe Saskatchewan, maybe Atlantic Canada would have something to say about that. So I, I just think it's important that in a time, Michael, of, of a lot of uncertainty in the world, uh, geopolitically, economically, and that this is something that uh, we should discuss and, and reassure Canadians that, you know, we, we can work together to, to keep the Canada Pension Plan together. Yeah, it's interesting you, you talk about the numbers because obviously you're referring to the 53% to the claim of assets that uh, Alberta is making uh, as this process begins. But, you know, to also hear it from Danielle Smith, if Alberta were to withdraw, it would only cost Canadians, she says, uh, who stay in the plan, an additional $175 a year to maintain uh, CPP stability and the current uh, benefit payout. Uh, do you accept that number or are you worried about that? kind of figure being quoted look i would say a couple of things uh, we're going to have uh, discussions so we can provide rigor on the analysis i know others have already taken a look at the some of the math you know when your country you're 11 percent of the population 16 percent of the contributions and you want 53 percent of the assets i don't i think most canadians would figure out that there you know, maybe some more work needs to be done on that and um, so so i also know having been in uh, finance for decades that when you have long-tailed uh, assets and liabilities like a pension plan does, uh, you make little assumption changes can have massive effects down the road. So, you know, the actuaries will go through it, the experts will go through it, we'll get multiple opinions. And I think one of the most important things to do at the same time is to make sure that we're talking about some of the reasons they feel uh, 
that they don't want to participate or you know they haven't said that they don't want to they want to hear from Albertans and I think it's important to hear from all Canadians how we value the Canada pension plan and how we value Alberta as a part of that plan yeah you know what let me pick up on that point though because I, I was wondering you know from your vantage point how much of this do you think is about the CPP versus a, you know a symptom of a greater frustration with Ottawa well, you'd have to ask Ottawa, I mean, Ottawa and Alberta a bit more on that. But I can tell you, I, I can share some of the frustration from Alberta. And I, I certainly uh, I lived in Calgary one summer. And, you know, the, the population is growing very fast in Alberta, uh, just like it is in uh, Ontario. And we have to make sure that the economic prosperity and the infrastructure is in place. Now, here in Ontario, for example, we want to build a 400 highway series 413 just in Brampton, one of the most populated and busiest places in all of North America. And we can't get moving because of impact assessments from, from Ottawa. Um, so, you know, this is provincial jurisdiction. Um, this is a provincial sovereignty because we've got explosive population growth in part because Ottawa is a, is a partner in bringing a lot of Canadian people to Canada. And I think that's a great thing. But we have to get stuff built, and um, you know, I, I think Alberta shares some of those frustrations as well. So, do you see yourself in this process, you know, ahead of this meeting coming together? Do you see yourself as, as perhaps a an ally to Alberta as it explores opportunities, or do you see yourself in opposition to Alberta regarding the CPP? I don't see this as for or against. What I what I think, and being a, um, a lifelong Canadian, um, is that uh, when we work together. We can solve just about anything and i think one thing that we saw during COVID is where we work federally provincially municipally together boy we got a lot done and i think that's what canadians want us to do and it's not just about the canada pension plan which i think is something that binds all of us together provides portability sustainability and and security for for canadians in a very turbulent time but you know we we want people to come to this great country we want people to prosper to get that done and i think that's uh why i don't think it's a for or against it's a together mm -hmm. you know the, again i want to pick up on that point because that's interesting because as you talk about uh working together i, I have been wondering uh, because we are in this very polarized time people very worried about you know their bottom line their, their monthly income do you think this debate has the potential to have a negative impact on national unity well, I, that's certainly not uh, the purpose of going into this. I think, uh, you know, having uh, finance ministers talk about common issues, whether we agree on everything or don't agree on everything, my my view always is is when you uh, you bring all your interests to the table, you find those areas where you can agree. And I think there's a lot of things that we can agree on, whether it's Alberta, Atlantic Canada, the territories, east, west, north, south. Uh, and I think we've got an urgent need to do that because you know if you'll just look at Ontario we we uh we our population grew by almost a half a million people last year this year we're on track for another half a million that's a million people over over two years similar dynamics going right across the country including Alberta you know we we need to build schools we need to build roads we need to build infrastructure we we got to open up the ring of fire we're talking about a uh, a road an access road uh, up to the critical minerals that many want for the electric vehicle batteries. And uh, Joe Biden, President Biden, says, you've got them all here. And we're talking about a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the north, where you can fit Germany, France, and England into northern Ontario. And First Nations are leading the environmental assessment. So, you know, when we work together, we need the federal government. We need to work on, on things that uh, drive this country forward. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, quickly running out of time, but I do have to ask you, Minister, because uh, Christopher Freeland does say that a meeting will happen, but no details yet. Any idea of particulars at this point as to timing? I don't. I mean, I, I just uh, I sent the letter on uh, yesterday morning at 9 a.m., so I think we're moving pretty fast. I was very encouraged by Christopher Freeland. She immediately said that's a great idea. Uh, the chair of the Federal Provincial uh, Territories uh, meeting, Alan uh, McMaster, the Minister of Finance of Nova Scotia, is leading the charge to get us together. Um, I, I, my, I'm an optimist. I think we'll get together sooner than later, and I think we just have uh, that urgency to, to keep working on things for not just Ontarians, but for all Canadians. Okay, so forewarning, we'll probably call you for an interview at that point. But <laughs> for now, Minister... Stay close to my phone. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, Minister, thank you for the time this evening. Really appreciate it.
Always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, let's continue the conversation right now with our political panel. Joining us this week, Susan Smith, principal with the Blue Sky Strategy Group, Chuck Strahl, former conservative MP and cabinet minister, and Anne McGrath, national director for the NDP. Good to see all three of you. It's nice to see you. So, well, glad to have you, Chuck. Uh, so listen, here is the CPP. Let's start with that because a national meeting is meant to happen with all the finance ministers from across the country. But should this be a meeting about crunching the numbers or coming up with a national defense for the CPP? Susan, I'll get you to start us off. I think it's actually going to be national offense for the CPP and the, the finance ministers who are opposed to what Premier Smith wants to do, i.e. take a bigger than 50% chunk of the CPP, are going to be pushing back. There are so many Canadians well, who've contributed to the CPP and it wasn't about the postal code that they lived in when they worked or the postal code that they live in when they collect. And that's the, the beauty and the strength of the CPP. And so I think the finance ministers are going to be on offense to protect it. Uh, Chuck, what do you think? Oh, I think that's the case, yeah. Although, you know, it's interesting that Daniel Smith opened with the numbers, not with the strategy because uh, you know the, the numbers she opened with are gobsmacking and uh, whether they hold in the long run or not it's uh, you know it certainly got the spidey senses all tingling amongst the rest of the finance ministers and uh, as they say they've got she's got their attention but I think this first meeting is going to be about you know what can we do collectively to push back on her and that's likely what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think Chuck is right that the, the, the numbers that she came out with at the very beginning were just so unbelievable. Like gobsmacking is probably the right word. It was incredible to think that that that, that one province could say that they were that, that they had over half of the fund. But let's remember, first of all, that this is a very healthy fund. This is a very good pension plan, pu public pension plan. Um, and, and, and it's actually been strengthened uh, in, in recent years. So I think people will be very worried about it. And when we originally talked about this, we talked about the fact that she's going to face a lot of opposition in the province of Alberta mm -hmm. um, uh, from, from citizens, from employer groups. Uh, she's going to face a lot of opposition in Alberta to this. But we also talked about the fact that she was going to face a lot of opposition from the other premiers. And that is a real weakness uh, in, in her stra whatever her strategy is. Um, it's a huge vulnerability because when you're going to have other conservative premiers like Ford and Mo probably and and others are not going to be on board with this, and they're going to. She's going to find herself increasingly isolated, I believe. Yeah, well, and you know, pointing out the fact that it was Ontario and another province under a conservative government that that raised the issue, called for this national meeting. We just uh, spoke to the finance minister, but you know, as you talk about this offense defense for for the CPP, I'm kind of wondering what the role of the federal government will be in that, and the kind of role that uh, Justin Trudeau might play, because here he is in Alberta, not very popular in the province. The party not very popular in the province. W would his involvement defending, fighting for the CPP actually help Danielle Smith's side since a lot of it, it also touches on grievances that Alberta has with Ottawa? I, I think anything Justin Trudeau says in Alberta or anything Danielle Smith says in most of the rest of the country is already people have made up their minds regardless of what they say. I think this will be a, a, a battle that all of the ministers will take up. It won't just be the prime, prime minister. But Anne said it correctly. This is going to be an issue where Danielle Smith's going to find herself incredibly isolated and ironically it may benefit the Prime Minister because his the folks that are natural allies to Premier Smith, Scott Moe and others in this case are opposed to what she wants to do. Her math doesn't add up. It's not in the interests of the citizens of any of the provinces and I think especially Albertans, she's not got a lot of people on side. She didn't campaign on it. They've got an opioid crisis. They have a housing affordability crisis. There was just a terrible crisis and tragedy in a daycare system. There's a lot of things going wrong and this isn't the fight that I think Albertans want Danielle Smith to pick. So she's, I think, going to find herself, you know, Team Alberta and everybody else on Team CPP. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck, what do you, do you have to say that? Because I, I am wondering about well, the type of role that Justin Trudeau might play, if any at all, in this. Yeah, I don't think he has a choice. I mean, all the federal leaders are going to support the CPP, and I think they probably have to. But, you know, the, Mr. Polyev is not wrong to say that what's galvanized this thing at this time is a culmination of a bunch of things that, especially Albertans, but all the oil producing provinces feel that Mr. Trudeau has gone out of the, his way to pick on them. You know, they could, in some of that stuff has recently been declared unconstitutional, even. So, 
you know, there's not much doubt. This issue's been burbling since the firewall letter, and it's not it's not new, but it's kind of coming to a head because people say, you know, enough's enough. I mean, you you got to let Alberta and the other provinces do what they do best, and it seems like every at every turn, the prime minister is shafting them. And when that feeling starts to percolate, well, then people want to take action. I think this is just happens to be the issue of the day, but it's uh, it's certainly all part and parcel of, you know, what it's seen in Alberta, at least as an aggressive anti-Alberta campaign by the Prime Minister. It's being drummed up, Chuck. I mean, it, Alberta's oil and gas success, there's no question of what they've had, but it, it's been built on the backs, yes, of Albertans, but on Newfoundlanders and Nova Scotians and Prince Edward Islanders and Quebecers and people from all over the country that went and worked in the oil and gas sector. Some of them stayed in Alberta, some of them went back home. And so this is where I think Premier Smith has not only miscalculated the math on the CPP, she's miscalculated the sentiment on CPP. And there are ordinary Albertans who've contributed to that. Their children have contributed to that. They want a secure future. And people who worked in Alberta and have gone back home or live in other parts of the country, they want the secure future that they've earned as well. So this is where I think that Premier Smith is missing the boat. Well, yeah, go I, ahead, think, I think she's made a, a miscalculation in, in that uh, a lot of Albertans are very frustrated with the federal government, and it never hurts an Alberta premier to, to, to pick a fight with the federal government. Uh, but I think that there is a difference between the way Albertans feel about uh, energy and natural resource questions versus other things like the like the Canada pension plan. So I think that juxtaposing uh, the 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 kind of anti Ottawa sentiment that does exist in Alberta, legitimately so, uh, and juxtaposing that into this issue, I think is is a really big mistake. And and that's I think where she's she's really you know she's really it's a big misstep. However, I can see partly why she's doing it. She is coming up to an annual general meeting, a, a convention, uh, where there is a strong push by the Take Back Alberta folks to change a lot of things in in the Constitution and in the way that the party works and to weaken um, uh, weaken her grasp on the leadership. So she is partly playing to that particular part of the UCP. Yeah, I, I, Chuck, I think I, I, I heard you want to jump in on that. Yes, well, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that several premiers, not all of them, but several premiers have, you know, risen to the bait and to debate, I should say, and said, uh, you know, the numbers are crazy. The numbers are crazy. You know, the whole thing is a, a lark. It never happened, so on. Yeah, they're plenty worried right now. It may not be, the numbers may not be accurate. I don't know. But there's going to be, this thing's going to end up in court, and the numbers are going to be big. They're going to be huge. And when they're, not, when they're whatever they are, there's going to be, the reason they're all in a dither right now is because no matter what the numbers are, they're worried. Now, I say, you know, I'm personally, I'm in favor of the CPP. I agree with Mr. Polyev that it's, uh, you know, I hope Albertans follow that way, and they may well do so. But I don't think you should pretend that this isn't a big issue because that's why the premiers are worried. It's a big issue because it's a big number. Okay. Well, listen, we'll keep watching that. I do want to move on to another topic because we did see Aaron O'Toole, of course, a former Conservative leader, former uh, MP, now private citizen, appearing before the House Procedures Committee today. And, and he was talking once again about foreign interference, still very concerned about it. And I want to begin with, you know, a question that was asked of him uh, by Michael Cooper, because here you have Mr. O'Toole being targeted by, by China in, in the 2021 campaign, but there's this two-year gap before it was actually acknowledged uh, by, by civil servants publicly, by, by, by the the government uh, publicly and you know Mr. Cooper asked whether or not the Prime Minister in Mr. O'Toole's opinion should be apologizing to him for that two-year gap but what do you say to that Susan? I was quite taken with the part of Mr. O'Toole's um, testimony or responses at committee where he said that multiple governments have been like the boiling frog when it comes to foreign interference. Um, multiple governments did not adequately take the concept of foreign interference seriously and over time the nature and scope of it has changed and become a bit more aggressive so i think what's very interesting there is that this is an issue that has been sort of maybe humming along percolated up a bit further and now we have a justice who's in a public inquiry finally into it um i think it's it's a 
been a challenging situation, and I think the government is re-looking how they do things. Um, this is why you heard the Prime Minister come forward on the, the allegations with India right away and quickly. The, the media were about to go public. There's still a leak somewhere in our, our secret service where this kind of stuff is hitting journalists before it hits anything else. So I think the issue is how we address it. Whether or not the Prime Minister has an individual responsibility for an individual, I, I don't know, I think that's up for debate. But I think the way the government governments handle this issue going forward has got to get a lot tougher. Yeah, Chuck, what do you say to that? An apology, is it owed here? Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, Mr. Uh, Aaron has, has said it, I think, very clearly. In fact, you know, one of the reasons I supported him when he ran for leader the, initially, in the first go there, was because his policy on China was probably the most fleshed out part of his entire leadership campaign. He was he was tough on them, and I think for good reason. And uh, certainly, this, you know, CSIS and CSE and others of the uh, of the security establishment have repeatedly told Canadians and parliamentarians that China is the number one threat to our democracy. And they, I mean, it was happened again just a couple of months ago. I mean, it was it's publicly known, and uh, and yet there doesn't seem to be a lot of action on it. Certainly, from Mr. O'Toole's point of view, you can see why he takes this a little bit personally. You know, he waited two years, uh, uh, as did Mr. Chong, waited all this time while others seemed to know that they were actually in the crosshairs. And that's pretty discomforting for somebody who's a, a national leader or has been and uh, wonders why, why on earth couldn't the bureaucrats and the political class get their act together enough to warn them that this was happening. Yeah, well, it was interesting to see uh, to see that report earlier this week so, saying that there needs to be a greater uh, education, if you will, for not only civil servants but also politicians to be aware. Uh, and what do you Absolutely. think? Absolutely. I mean, and, and I think it's got to be really alarming if you're one of those parliamentarians who discovers that, that this has been the case, whether it's uh, Mr. O'Toole, Jenny Kwan uh, in, in the NDP, um, you know, Michael Chong. Uh, absolutely alarming. Um, and I think that if there is fault uh, in this, it, I don't think it's. I, I think where, where it is is in the response. Once the once these allegations kind of really took hold, and it became obvious that the evidence was mounting that there was a problem, not just with China, but but China certainly a, a very very critical to all of this. Um, uh, that the res that the decision to go to a public inquiry took so long. Like it was like I, I I don't understand why the government was kind of dragged screaming and kicking into what was the logical outcome of those kinds of allegations and not just allegations but also evidence. Yeah and you know and to that of course now uh, Justice Hogue is, is going to lead this public inquiry. Uh, we're waiting for an interim report sometime in February which would be essentially a calendar year has passed since you know the, the news was broken on this. Uh, are, are, are you concerned at all or any of you concerned at all that we're still waiting for action and, and and yes, there was the delay, but it seems that we're not getting a lot of news about how this, this inquiry is progressing. Yeah, but that's the point, Mike. First of all, it's bigger. Um, I'm glad, and I agree with you, it took a long time to get to public inquiry, and we need one. But the reality is, this is national security. So this is not an inquiry that should take place with doors wide open and all cameras and microphones on at all time. I think there's more, it's a broader scope. There's more for the justice to review, the judge to review. And I think this is an adequate amount of time, then it, nobody can say it's been rushed, it hasn't been thorough, in order to get the report. So I, for one, don't want our national security secrets and tactics aired on the front pages of anything. It's bad enough that we have foreign interference. Let's not make it easy for them to continue to interfere. So part of the process is, you know, how this information or intelligence is gathered you don't reveal that stuff because that lets them know what you're doing or how, you know, what your allies are doing. So February, I think it's fine. Okay, Chuck, what do you think? Well, I mean, February is fine as far as the, the justices report or interim report, and we all expect there to be some meat and potatoes on that one. But I mean, a lot of this politically comes down to like, what did you know? When did you know it? And what did you do about it? And not, some of that does not require any justice or anybody else to to run interference and the prime minister is nothing to stop him to say you know i have instructed i have instructed my staff the following way i've instructed the bureaucrats the following way never again will somebody be in a, a sitting parliamentarian be uh in the crosshairs again that i'm not going to know about it and that that mp is not going to have not not going to know about it and have the protection that he or she needs i, I mean there's nothing to stop that
And he should be doing that. He should be saying, when did I know? What did I do about it? And there's things he can do. He doesn't have to wait for a report to do a, take a bunch of steps to make sure that that never happens again. Okay, and last word to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that those are critical questions, and uh, and so I think that the, the the kind of you know you always say the proof is in the pudding. It'll be what 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 is in that interim report about those questions. So, for instance, Mr. David Johnson was was tasked with those exact questions as well. What did you know? When did you know it? What did you do about it? And he basically um, skated over it and said, "Oh, nothing to see here." And I think that was a big part. I mean, there were many other things, but that was a big part of, I think, the problem with that particular report that we got from him. So uh, February, fine with me, but it's got to have some meat on the bones. It's got to have actually some substantive stuff in there. We do have to know, in particular, what did the Prime Minister's office uh, know? When did they know it? What did they do about it? Okay. Well, of course, we will talk again, uh, but for now, thank you for that. To Susan and in studio, thank you as always. Uh, Chuck, really good to have you on the program today. Thank you for that. Well, thanks for having me. Time now for a look at the other stories making headlines today. Seven Canadians are now confirmed killed in the Israel-Hamas war, and at least two others remain missing. This according to Global Affairs Canada. The Prime Minister did meet with opposition parties today behind closed doors to discuss the government's position on the conflict. NDP leader Jagmeet Singh and Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchette speaking to reporters afterwards. Blanchette saying that Canada is in talks with big players, its allies, which makes its stance stronger, while Singh once again called for a ceasefire in Gaza. The Conservative leader Pierre Polyev was not in Ottawa for the briefing, so the party's foreign affairs critic Michael Chong attended instead. Meanwhile, more than 70 humanitarian, faith, labor and civil society organizations gathered in support of an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The only way forward and the only way for both Israelis and Palestinians to achieve a semblance of peace and security is to engage in a real process to address the long-standing oppression and deprivation of rights of the Palestinian people. That, Mr. Blair, Prime Minister Trudeau, Madame Jolie, is the only way, is the only path for a genuine just peace. And the first, to first step towards it is a ceasefire. Thank you. If international humanitarian law is to have any meaning or effect, Canada and the international community must insist on an immediate ceasefire and an end to the occupation of Palestine. The coalition also says Canada should call for an end to the blockade and for the uninterrupted distribution of humanitarian aid in Gaza. Mary Moreau will be Canada's next Supreme Court Justice. Moreau is an Albertan Francophone who served as the Chief Justice for the Court of King's Bench in Alberta since 2017, the first woman to do so. Moreau's nomination will be put to a special committee hearing on November the 2nd. She replaces former Justice Russell Brown. And there will be no carbon tax on home heating oil for at least the next three years. The federal government announcing the move today after months of pressure from the opposition. The exemption will begin in two weeks' time. This is a program that continues to push what we need, which is to reduce our emissions and to support families as we do it. Ottawa is also doubling the rebate top-up for rural residents from 10% to 20%. The supplement meant to compensate those who require more energy and have fewer transportation options. And that is our program for this Thursday evening. For everyone here at CPAC, thank you for watching. I'm Michael Serapio. Primetime Politics will be back tomorrow night. But up next, Esteveja avec l'Essentiel.